Um, and I want to talk about two aspects of the lamb. And uh, they're written here on the board with better handwriting than what I have. Lamb king and goat judger. I like that word judger. Is that an actual word? I don't know. It is now. It is now. I've, you know, I regularly s submit my words to Google or whatever <laughs> so that they'll add them. How many goat judges are out there? You know what I mean? <laughs> That's wrong. That's, <laughs> That's very wrong. <laughs> All right. Um, and I want to use David and Solomon in my examples. And I will say this, there are the things that I'm going to address, or at least the area there's a lot to be said, and um, I'm only going to take the time for just a contrast of two different things. Um, and so if you know much greater things on this subject, then keep it to yourself, not really. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I will... Um, I will tell you... You, it is not required that you believe what I tell you tonight. <laughs> okay. If the Lord bears witness and you can see it, and I do have a lot of scriptures. <clears throat> let's begin with David. And let's begin in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, during the events of 2 Samuel 16... David is king, okay? He is the true king, and he has every right um, to function as a king in all the aspects that a king would normally function in. He not only is king <clears throat> by... Uh, the people receiving him as such and by the prophets, the prophet and the, the high priest anointing him as such before all the people and declaring him as king, that was official stuff and that really didn't just come, autom I mean, didn't come immediately. Uh, he was on the run for years and even while he was on the run, he was king because Samuel when he was about 16 years old, came to his father's house and anointed him as king. And uh, had done that over Saul, who had been king, but in God's eyes, David was now king. And so, um, to really grasp uh, being a king to really grasp being given authority by God. The, the way to learn about that is not to start after David becomes king over all Israel, or even before that when he became king over um, Judah and Benjamin, but to watch the events of his life all the way through after he was anointed. And you see aspects at work in him that are, are regal to God, that are worthy of being called a king. And they're not, they're not the things that we would say that, you know, winning great victories and all that. It's how he bore himself before the people. And we have one of those examples here, and I thought this was a good place to start. So in 2 Samuel 16, starting with verse 5, and we'll read 5 through 13. And when King David came to Baharim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul. Okay, so, so what you have to realize is 
he has already, Absalom has already taken over Jerusalem. He, Absalom, his son, owns the center of power, Jerusalem. Well, to David, that's not the center of power. God is. And so the scripture here still calls him King David. <laughs> Even while he's on the run. Still calls him King David. Okay. And then there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, and whose, whose name was Shemaiah. And that's the way I've always pronounced it, and I'm sure it's wrong. Um, and so the story begins, and what it begins with actually is, again, not just the situation with Absalom, with Jerusalem being taken over by a new king, and David on the run, but David is still the king. But long before that, God rejected Saul as king. He rejected him. And that's when he had David anointed. And, and he did so because he found David to be a man after God's heart. Now, I know we're all familiar with that phrase, but I just believe to God that means way more than what it means to us because he's a man after God's heart. God knows his own heart. <laughs> you know, God, God knows what he cares about. We don't. We think we do, but we really don't. <clears throat> we know what we care about. That's clear. Yes. Yeah, so to be a man after, yeah, I mean, to be a man after God's heart then to us is we are the literal definition of that because that's what we think. And we would be wrong again. <clears throat> anyway, so here it is years later. <clears throat> David not only has survived King Saul, who is not king anymore, he's just Saul, but he wears a crown and lives in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and, and I mean, I'd like for us to kind of think in terms of how this applies to us. I'd, I'd like for us to think in terms of the difference between titles and spirit, the difference between um, <clears throat> uh, being in charge and being what God wants, you know, big, big differences there. So even to this day, Saul and almost all of his family are dead. There's still somebody left. <laughs> and, he's, and it's still Saul harassing David and chasing him out of Jerusalem. Okay. So, you know, this is no light thing. Now, I don't think, this is my, my opinion, I don't think David was worried at all. I mean, David had more men on his side than they did and all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, David knew that God had anointed him as king and therefore he was the one. And he even said as much, uh, I don't even think we read that in these particular scriptures, but it is right in this same chapter even said as much that, you know, he sent the Ark back, the Ark of the Covenant, where was the presence of God, and says, if God wants me to be king, he will bring me to him. I'm not going bring to bring him to me in my crisis. You know, and that's a big deal. All right, so let's read this. <clears throat> and when King David came to Baharim, Behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemaiah, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of the king and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right and on his left. And I, I, I think I mentioned this in my newsletter, but I'd never noticed before. You know, his mighty men 
many of them had horses and stuff like that. And they're marching in a row, two rows going down there. And he's in between David's mighty men cursing them. These guys have defeated vast kingdoms. And of course, Abishai, uh, the brother of Joab, says, let me take his head off. He's got his sword right there, and he goes, this will be real easy, king. We can end this. And so we see, um, verse 7, And thus said Shemai when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial, which is a term used to, for the most reprobate people. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, the son of Zerai, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Now, you know, when you see something and you know it's wrong, best thing to do for you is to pull out your sword and take their head off, right? Isn't that, isn't that right? I mean, no. But that's one way of maintaining a kingdom, maintaining rule, maintaining order, maintaining Verse 10, and the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zuriah? So it's all of them. <laughs> so let him curse. So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. See, and we, we would never, the Lord would never send anybody to curse me or you. I mean, that's the way we think. Oh, I'm too nice, you know. But David goes, you know, he really is Lord of all. He uses all things. And since this, you know, I can hear David thinking, since this is one of the all things in everything, I'm going to give thanks. Sorry for tying that with my last sharing there, but it was uh, inevitable. What have I to do with it? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? See, we, don't, we can't imagine that God would send somebody to curse us, can we? We think that's the devil. But what if it's God and we fight against that? Then we're fighting against God and claiming we're fighting against the devil and basically calling God the devil. I mean, you know. <clears throat> and David said unto Abishai and to all of his servants, to, he said this to everybody, Behold, my son which came forth of my bowels seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. So basically what he's saying is, if I handle this in a right spirit, maybe the Lord, if I, if I, in everything, handle it with a right spirit, then maybe this thing that appears bad could be turned to good or work together, obviously, for the larger picture, for good. Now, is it possible <clears throat> that all of us can sit here and go, oh, yes, that's so good, that's, that's heaven. Uh, and yet the next time some problem comes up, we, we think it's the devil, or, 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 or if we don't think it's the devil, we just think it's, you know, a, a what? So-and-so's problem. So -so's problem. I thought you said a sausage problem. <laughs> you know, you need to get in the word a little more here. If you'd eat more sausage, you wouldn't be so sour there. Um, but, the, but is it possible that we could turn around and the next little thing that arises, and you know, 
I mean, remember Jesus? He, he's his first appearing, and he steps down in the Jordan, and God says, from heaven, opens the heavens and says, sends the Spirit and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the next thing that happens is he's taken out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. Why? Every temptation that we have written there that the devil tempted him over said, if you're the son of God, this is my beloved son. Let's test him on it. And anything that you hear, you're going to be tested on. Now, how many of you think that you've made a B plus in all of your... <laughs> all of, on all of your tests. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, when we were sinners, there were none righteous, but now we're all righteous, right? Well, not in ourselves and not the way we think, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, and as David and his men went by the way, Shemaiah went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. So, so this last verse is Shemaiah taking a hill. The men, the, the men are marching along down here, and there's this hill right here, and he's literally walking up beside David because it's very specific, him, not them now. He's... He's walking right there and cursing him and throwing rocks at him and stuff. David, remember, David is the king. David has every right to deal with this situation. But he doesn't deal with it the way we think because David is the king. He's God's king. He's God's king. He's God's man. He's God's man in that position. And he understands what all of that means. He understands that it is it's not about power and rule and force. And by the way, that pretty much describes the beasts in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> it's not all of that. All right. So we see that David was a lamb king. He was a lamb king with Shemaiah, and he was a lamb king with so many other people. And he lived in accord with the Lamb, in the spirit of the Lamb. And, and here's the deal. We could say, and David showed mercy to Shemaiah or these other people. And David showed mercy. But more than David showing mercy, David, listen to the phrase, showed kind, parenthesis. God, in the very beginning, before there was a fall, let us make man after our image and likeness, after our kind. I want, this is God, Father, Son, because the word let us is Elohim, and it is three. It is plural, in other words. Let us, Father wanted it, the Son wanted it, the Holy Spirit wanted it. They wanted, they didn't want a big creation. They didn't want animals. They didn't want, yes, they created all that for man so that he could have dominion over it and whatever, but he didn't want it. He wanted this. This is what I want. I just want, I want this segment to be mine, to really be mine, to really be after my kind, and to relate on a heart basis and not just a religious basis. Well, there is a God he created us. I believe in him. That settles it. That gets me into heaven. <laughs> Whatever. You know, of course, the Bible says, well, the devil believes also there's a God and trembles, which seems like he's got more sense than we do. <clears throat> okay. So, and it's this area of demonstrating kind is a big deal because we, we religiously have given names and everything. Well, the, it was the grace of God that did that for me. No, it wasn't. It was God. 
in his grace. But it was a person who did that for you. It wasn't the grace of God. Or, or in his mercy, you know, he didn't kill Shemaiah. No, it was, it was way more than his mercy. It was, it was that David demonstrated kind to be after the Lord's heart. See? See? Okay. When we talk about David was a man after God's heart, this is the kind of stuff that was after God's heart. This is the beauty. This is the thing that God says, that's kind. I love that. I love it. I don't just like it. This is a... This is the first show of any of this for about a thousand years, so I'm going to enjoy this, you know. <laughs> All right, so eternal purpose. Not calling to ministry, eternal purpose. You see, there's a difference. You see the different words? Eternal purpose, calling for to a certain ministry on the earth. It's two different things. It's two different things. I believe you can do both, but I believe that, that any ministry you do in earth that doesn't really comprehend eternal purpose probably has a lot of you in it. I'm just guessing at that. I don't know. I really don't know much. But I'm assuming from 45 years of ministry that man or something to it. All right, so let's, his, so his purpose for making everything, this is gonna sound weird, but, I, but I'm gonna bear it out in the next scriptures we read. The purpose he had for making everything was so that he could get lambs or the lamb in people. All right, so let's go to Matthew 25. In verse 31, and we're going to read all the way down to 43 because there's several things in here that are important. Matthew 25, verse 31. <clears throat> when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd. He'll separate them as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, so, so we know the rest. We're going to read it. But basically up to this point, he, he just says to the sheep, the lamb-looking group, but not just outwardly, come be with me. But he's going to state why. And the reasons that he's going to add to that is that they are demonstrations of lamb. <laughs> they demonstrated being a lamb. You know, what is the difference between, well, let's just say an outward appearance. What's the difference between a lamb and a lamb in sheep's, or wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, outwardly, they can look a lot alike, right? But inwardly, the inward produces certain things. A wolf wants to rip up other, other sheep and other lambs, right? Sila. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the lamb just wants to be, let's just say, it wants to be what it was made to be by nature. It doesn't know enough to, to act, you know, I have to act a certain way among the sheep. You know? <laughs> what? Well, it says that in the pastor's office. They didn't know that they had done that house. Cheater. No, you're fine. You're fine. And you're fine and you're right. 
Um, verse 35, for I was hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto me, unto one of the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. This is lamb actions. It is choosing the least, not the greatest, and it's doing it not for the least, not for the poor, but unto him. Okay. But you don't always have to know that. I think it's good to know your motives personally. I do. I think it's I think that's a big huge thing and I think it's probably this is just me personally and I don't count. But that it, I I think it's one of the biggest problems that in Christianity today is the fact that people don't even know their own motives. They do stuff and they have no I mean there's a reason, trust me. You don't do stuff with just no reason. There's a reason. And either that reason is lamb motive or it is you motive. But we can, we can mold things to make it look like the lamb when, you know. I mean, I, I, I remember many times over the years, someone would give a big offering and I would fail to say, oh my God, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so just gave a huge love give to the church and then they'd get real mad at me well you didn't even tell anybody that i gave it i'm thinking well if you you know if that's the only reward you want because that's the way jesus put it you know you have your reward then she did it you know but i'd much rather be before the lord and he said that was my my lamb within you that was my son that was another spirit than what the spirit of the world. You say, but this is the church. It can't be the spirit of the world. <laughs> what? All right. And so, um, let's see. Verse 41, uh, 41, then shall you say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting, uh, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he says, I was hungry. I was, but you, and, and so this, you know, we talk about angels unaware. <laughs> you, you know that scripture? Yeah, that, that it could have been, a, I remember somebody on Bolivar when we were over in the, there somebody stood up and says, you know, the Bible talks about angel unaware, uh, underwear. And I went, <laughs> All right. I was this. I was hungry, and you gave me not. I was thirsty. Greater than if an angel showed up and we didn't know it was an angel. Jesus shows up all the time in his body. Jesus lives in us. And there are many times that we don't take care of Jesus. You know why? Because we go, oh, that's just brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. And we take account of wrongs and we keep records and we, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you know we hold grudges and we, you know, there's always stuff. There's stuff in us. Um, and, and it, you know, it just perverts and muddies the pure river that's supposed to be flowing out of the, the bride, New Jerusalem, which has the lamb enthroned and coming out of his throne, but it's coming out of her to the nations to bring healing. It's muddied and polluted and it can't. You know, it goes around certain trees and doesn't feed them as it moves along and all this kind of stuff. 
All right. So the purpose in judgment, and, and so here we have the lamb king with David, but now we're talking about a goat judger. <laughs> and that's, this is the Lord now. He's judging, but he's, in a certain sense, you could say that he's not judging the goats. He's judging what is not the lamb. Now, he would know because guess who's on the throne doing that judging? A lamb. Right? A lamb. Now, he knows. So you can go, yeah, but, you know, I didn't I do all this work and didn't I minister on the streets and didn't I do anything? He goes, I never knew you. Well, we go, what do you mean you know me? My name's Randy Nussbaum, for God's sake. I've been in the ministry forever. He goes, well, you see that spirit? I don't know that as my spirit. That's not me. I don't know that. I don't know you. I know this lamb over here, but you're a goat, and we really don't jive. So you get over here, okay? And we're going to get over here. <clears throat> All right. So he's judging what is not lamb. In this case, he's judging what is not lamb. In these scriptures, he's judging what is not lamb, what is not sheep, what is not kind. He's judging kind. And anywhere in the scriptures where it talks about a great judgment, he judged their works. Uh, I forget where it is. might even be here. But uh, there are several different places. And it talks about of what sort their works were. Not just their works, but of what sort they were. Were they goats? where they land. All right. So, now here, here, here's where we may depart ways, or you may not agree with this. I believe the judgment, for the most part, is not about God vindicating mistreatment of lambs. I know. Because I believe the lamb laid down his life. I don't believe that he wants vindication. I don't believe that he's looking for it. I don't believe he's going, yeah, get him! You know, because then he wouldn't be lamb anymore. It can't be that. <clears throat> it can't be that spirit. But it can be, that's not lamb. And therefore, this is what's been prepared for everything that is similar to the devil, because it uses the word, and his angels. I mean, that's sobering. I mean, if you'd have come in here drunk, you'd be sober right now. <laughs> that's how sobering that should be, but I, I don't see any of you looking drunk, except maybe Kelly with those sunglasses on back. What's going on? <laughs> Yeah. So to be lamb, for Jesus to be lamb is not necessarily to be rewarded. The Father said, you know, because you laid down your life, because you lost, because I love this spirit, therefore I choose to exalt that. But he didn't say, exalt me. He didn't, you know, did you know Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead? <laughs> if, if, he didn't, if he didn't get raised, the Father raised him. If he didn't, if someone didn't do it, he wouldn't be raised. So, all right. So now I want to go look at some other scriptures here. I was really hoping to get through with all of this in this section. Let's go to 1 Kings. Chapter 2. <clears throat> All right. In 1 Kings, we have David <clears throat> about to die, and he says some words to Solomon. And so here's what I want you to see. David is the lamb king. Solomon is the goat judger. 
David is the living lamb among us, and Solomon is the goat judger on the throne. Now, again, I'm not saying you have to agree with all this. <clears throat> Verse 1, 1 Kings 2, 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth, be thou strong therefore, and show thyself a man. Now drop down to verse 8. And behold, thou hast with thee Shemaiah, the son of Gera, Benjamin of Baharim, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Manahimon, whatever that is. And he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Okay. Now, David, I think, recognized that he was, Shemaiah was a goat. I'm just, you know, I'm thinking. But David said, this guy was a goat. But I told him, as a lamb, as a living lamb among them, I will not kill him. You can say, I will show mercy, but he was saying, I will be the living lamb among you. Okay? Verse uh, 9, Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him, and his hoary head bring thou down to the grave with blood. So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. All right. So we can say, well, David was just, he couldn't give it up for God's sake. <laughs> oh, my Lord, this has been a long time now, and he dies and everything. That's not the case. David re retained being the lamb. I will not kill you. I will not be the one to put the sword to you. I am with the Lord. I am trusting the Lord. You remember the words? I'm with the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. But you know, oh goat judger, <laughs> oh lamb divider, you know of what sort this is. He didn't tell him what to do in that sense. He didn't. In fact, maybe there's even more here. Uh, Uh, it could be in another book. It could be in Samuel or somewhere else. But I'm pretty sure that in this same account, it said something like, well, maybe it just said it here and I just went over it. Yeah, but there was something. What I remember is that David said something like, you in your wisdom. Okay, so maybe I missed it there. Thou art a wise man and knowest. That's the point. Not just knowest what thou should do unto him. Thou art a wise man and knowest. You have wisdom as a goat judger or, or, a, or a, you know, to, how to divide sheep from goats. And Solomon proves. He proves it. He proves that he knows what he's doing. He doesn't say, okay, get him in here. We're going to cut his head off right now. That's Abishai. Yes. Right? Yes. He, he's, he is David on the throne now, if you will. He is lamb on the throne, not down here among us, but in judgment. Yes. Yeah. It's a different situation now. All right? So... His wisdom says, you, you remember, the, and we won't read it all because there's a lot here, the, that there were cities of refuge. And if you had done something wrong or killed somebody or whatever, you could run to a city of refuge and you could hide in there. And as long as you stayed in that city of refuge, the, the avenger of blood would not touch you. Okay? What? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and the... Um, so, so Solomon goes, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to judge you. If you're really a goat, you'll judge yourself. So what he says is, I'm putting you in that city. 
Now you know how this works. Don't leave the city or you're going to die. Okay? So he puts him down there, and of course, Shem you know, Shemaiah is going, Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm sure he is. You know, thank you. I've been spared again. I should have died, but I'm in here now and everything. So he stays in there for a long time. Everything seems good. But one day, I think, I forget, he loses some goats or something. <laughs> some slaves. He loses some slaves. These are mine. I possess these people. So he goes, I'm going to go get them. Just the, the thing of, yes. that's mine. And, you know, so he goes and he steps outside and somebody comes and says, hey, we saw Shemaiah roaming around out here and just thought you'd want to know. <laughs> so Solomon calls him in and says, didn't I tell you what would happen if you did this? Yeah, but you don't understand. Really, I mean, if you were in my place, you would see this completely different. You would see this as a perfect Adamic creature and would understand me. <laughs> and, and the king says, dude, you just killed yourself. You just killed yourself. You just signed your own death warrant. I didn't kill you. David didn't kill you. You brought judgment on your own head. Turns to his, his uh, captain of the host, which Joab is long gone around the same step. And he goes and puts him to death. So, um, so Solomon is a king, but he's a king on the throne of judgment. And David was a king, but he was a lamb king among the people in real life. Not one day, but in real life. All right. I, we've got enough time here. I think we can do it. Okay, go to 1 um, Samuel 9, 1 and 2. 1 Samuel 9. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 9, verse 1 and 2. So anyway, while you're turning, goats tend to seal their own judgment. You know that, don't you? We always go, well, why is God judging those people? They, they brought it. They did it. Even when the lamb extended mercy and gave him a city of refuge. A city of refuge doesn't change your insides. You will violate it. You will violate everything that God has. You're a goat, not you personally, but, well, some of you, but they're not here tonight. <laughs> All right, verse one. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, okay? the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacharoth, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, 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 a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, okay? So we've gone back in time. A choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier, is that a word? Anyway. <laughs> person. See, the Bible taught me how to make up words. <laughs> Goodlier, and there was a um, person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. <clears throat> All right. So what you have here is the makings of Shemaiah. His name is Saul, a Benjaminite. Benjamite. And Shemaiah was from that line, remember? And just to make sure you remember, back to 2 Samuel 16 so that we can see the exact wording. Um, verse 7. This is 2 Samuel 16. And thus, and thus said Shemaiah when he cursed, come out. Well, you know what? In verse 
5. And when King David came to Baharam, behold, thence came out a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemaiah. Okay? And um, so what you see here is you see that there is uh, in Saul all of the makings of, you, you see two things. You see outwardly in Saul, you see a man that the people chose to be king. Who chose him? People. The people. Okay. Because he looked like a king. And because he had attributes that seemed really good and seemed, you know, all this kind of stuff. And David, come on, my God, he's a 16-year-old boy, the youngest of all these boys in his family. So much so that Samuel almost gave up looking. Don't, you know, I, this surely is the Lord's anointed. And now the Lord goes, no, that's not him. Finally, he gets down and he goes, don't you have any more sons? He goes, well, we really weren't expecting this one, but he's out there with the sh sheep. He's out there with his father's sheep, tending them. Preparation to be a king. A true king, not a king king. God's king. Brings him in, anoints him in place of Saul. All right. And then finally, we're going to wrap this up. Turn with me to the book of Esther. Because we can't seem to stop talking about the book of Esther, and we're probably going to read that word again, too. <laughs> <clears throat> Esther chapter 2. And verse 5. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Kish, of Benjamin. Ho! What? Oh, he did more than break the chain. He did more than break the chain who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with uh, Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father or, nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when, he, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. All right. So what we have here is we don't, we don't have, this is God looking now. You have, to, you have to learn to see through his eyes. We always say, well, the, you know, my eyes, you know, the scripture says, whose eyes are in the, in the head. To see through his eyes. We don't do that. That's not natural to us. We're not going to just turn and get that. We're going to have to have him as the head. And then we can see as he sees. But we're not going to learn it. Because we're not that. But if we see with his eyes, his, his eyes run to and fro over the whole earth, looking for that which will walk uprightly before him. Well, what does that mean? It means lamb. It means that which everything was made for. It means the whole basis of the judgment. Are you a lamb or are you not? And so here it's long years and many centuries and, you know, and they're in captivity and God's eyes fall, you know, and the, remember the first chapter is all about just Vashti and the whole, you know, whole mess up and the feast and all that kind of stuff. Now it's, now it's talking about central players. Okay. And God looks and he sees this guy and he goes, look at this guy. He has taken this orphan in. Remember when I was this and da 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 da. But it's not about being nice and merciful or taking care of the poor. It's about being lamb. 
And he's taking her in, and he's literally fathering what is not really even his. And he's doing it in a land where things are pretty tough. And I, instead of seeing just a good man or somebody that's got ulterior motives, I see lamb. I see lamb right there. Now, somebody could, one of the angels could say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord, don't let me interrupt, but do you realize that he's a Benjamite? Kish was the father of Saul, therefore he came through Saul, just like Shemaiah. In fact, let me mention his name right here. This is not good. I mean, can you trust that? And the Father and the Lord, the Lord goes, yeah, I trust it. It's lamb. I see me. I see lamb. I see that which is kind after my kind. And it changes the whole story. Everything changes. It's all changed. It's all different. Because... You don't have to be a goat. You don't have to be one. Nope. You don't have to be a goat. Nope. You can be a, how's it go, a lamb back. There is... There is nature, there is that which is bloodlines, there is that which is ties and all these things that we want to break. But the, the only true way to break it all is to break off being what you are born after. And you're born after goat. That's you, that's me, that's all of us. But that can be broken by lamb. That can be broken by saying, I don't want me anymore. I don't want goat anymore. I want lamb. That means with all my heart, I want you, Jesus. Not just Jesus, the Savior, the healer. Savior, healer, deliverer, all the things that we tout in church, that's just works of lamb. That's all it is. It's just the works of a lamb. But we go, deliverance, healing, you know, and never see the source, never glorify the source. Oh, God, send me healing. You know, your secondary, Lord, these things are important. No, they're not. They're just fruit off of the lamb. They're fruit of his, of his being, just like when he said, well, when I was, you, you fed me. When I was this, you took care of me because... That's me. That's, I'm the least. I come to you as the least, and if you are always looking for the greatest, you're going to miss me. So, so he didn't, so this story is not just a story of redemption. You know, Mordecai and Hadassah were redeemed from that horrible bloodline. It's, it's a story of no goat in them. No goat. And so the Lord, he doesn't judge the lamb. The lamb was already judged at Calvary. He judges the goats that wouldn't let Calvary judge them, that wouldn't allow the cross to do the work that it's supposed to accomplish in our lives. To be changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Father, take this word and make it life and make it real. Or Lord, may you have them overlook everything I've said and may you just speak what's in your heart, however you want to reach your people, to breathe the breath of life into them, then you do so. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
Um, you know what? <laughs>